well, one of the things I always did is like I never if I if I find something that I I believe is good, I invite everyone. Um, when I believe cutting hair was good, I invited my brother AJ. Um, AJ was supposed to start school with me, but it was a little slow getting getting that going. Uh, so he ended up coming later. And then most of the guys that are working here is guys that that I've spoken to years years in the past. You know, trying to get them. Hey, man, barbering is good, dude. You got to get in this. Well, it's still good. Like my brother here, he went to my college. Mm -hmm. That's Louis. Um, I've been trying to get him here for the last 10 years. And then finally, two years ago, he's like, all right, I'm finally doing it. And he's doing it. The man is making like four or five times more than he was getting paid his, his last job. Now he's reaped the benefit. Uh, you know, barbering is great. You know, that's why I'm, I'm a big advocate for it. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm there to let people know that, um, you know, I own my own house. I got, you know, a few businesses. I got stuff going on back home. Um, it's, it's something that you can really make a living. Um, but it's all about how, how you treat your clients. You know what I mean? It was uh, back in, uh, uh, I've been cutting hair since I was eight years old out of Haiti. Um, got to North Dakota, like I said, in 97. Um, there was no barber shop in, in Fargo. There was no barber shop that cuts ethnic hair in, in Fargo. Um, there was one other guy that he used to cut in his base, in his house, in his apartment, matter of fact. And he ended up moving away back in 2005. And during that time, I was in New York. And I came back 2006. I was out there for a few months or whatever with my brother. For about six months with my brother. And I came back and then uh, I got into a little trouble. And before I went and served some time in jail, uh, my wife told me like, man, you know how to cut hair. Why don't you just go to barber college? And that was back in 2006. And then uh, uh, graduated barber college. I went to Molo Barber College downtown. Graduated Molo Barber College summer of 2007. And then I worked for a friend of mine for about a year and a half. And then uh, a buddy of mine, Brandon LaFrance, he owned Taylor Made Barbershop, Barber Studio uh, over in Fargo. Um, me and him at that time, he started working with me where I was working at when I got out of, out of barber college. And uh, fall, it was summer of 2008, and we decided like, man, let's go into business, with, uh, go into business together. And we decided to open uh, Skill Cuts, uh, the Skill Cuts brand, uh, Skill Cuts Barbershop. What what got you into the barber game, bro? Um, I was in a refugee camp, and now uh, you know nobody got money to cut it in a refugee camp. Mm -hmm. So I started cutting all my guys' hair for free, and that way I was I was learning. So then I started liking it. And I started doing it. You know, I love meeting people, different people every day. And that's one thing about this barber world, right? It's so many people could speak that same language, you know? Yeah. How's things been since? Did you guys have to shut down the barber shop for a little bit, or you guys didn't have to do all that? Shut, uh, shut down. Like, we shut down for like a month and a half, almost. Man, how was that? Was that pretty difficult? Oh, yeah. yeah. You think barbers? You know how they kept saying a lot of people were like essential workers. Do you think that um, barbers should have been considered essential workers? Since you know, I mean, you got you guys provide a good service. You know. No, we, we have to be considered as a, a essential work because. We have people that depend on us to, you know, to, to keep them, 
motivated. You know, haircut mean a lot of people, a lot for 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 certain people. You know yeah. What I, mean? yeah. I bet. So how was it that first day you guys op opened back up? It had to be crazy, huh? Yeah, it was So we opened Skill Cuts back in uh, it was September 23rd, 2008. We opened Skill Cuts. Uh, we started with two chairs, it was just me and Brandon. And then now, Skill Cuts, me and Brandon kind of split. He has his own shop, I have Skill Cuts. He has Taylor Made, I still have Skill Cuts. Where Skill Cuts is sitting on, I think, I believe we have 24 chairs. That's crazy. And then also, <laughs> we, have, we have a barber college too that we opened three years ago. And also me and Brandon and uh, AJ, my brother. He's uh, he's AJ is a partner here too. Um, we've stuck together, you know, since way back. So we've been grinding it out, um, seeing what exactly we can do with this opportunity that we've been given. Because uh, North Dakota and South Dakota, uh, even going out west, you know, there's no, there's not a lot of barbershops that do what we do. So we specialize in ethnic hair, fades, whatever. But one of the things that they didn't have in Fargo that I, I thought I you know, might as well. A uh, place where you can get your braids, dreadlocks, stuff like that, you know. Um, I didn't want to leave uh, people with long hair out of it. People that want to do something different, like braids and dreadlocks. Um, so I thought I'd, you know, bring some girls to do that, some stylists. Um, so we got a house full of barbers and stylists, you know, that accommodate everybody's need. You know, we do black, white. We got one of the most diverse barber shops in North Dakota, so. Um, we serve everyone. We've been doing it for, you know, since 08, so. How long have you been cutting for, Will? I've been cutting for about, I started cutting when I was like eight, nine years old. Back wow, oh, yeah, yeah. that's crazy. And then uh, 2006, I went and got my license. I went to the barber college. Yeah, so I got two years under my belt. <laughs> A few, huh? Yeah. Yeah, just a few. It's funny, a lot of states, um, do you believe and do you have to go to school or do you prefer the mint, the mint, um, the uh, apprentice? I believe you should have to go to school due to, if you're trying to protect the profession, Yeah. you, you need to put some kind of education, some kind of uh, structure with it. Without yeah. no structure, haircut would be like, we couldn't, make, we wouldn't be able to make a living with it. It'll just be all unregulated all unregulated, across the board. And, you know, people would just do whatever. Shows the commitment thing for Correct, correct. Just yeah. That's one of the things they did in my country. You know, they, they totally ruined it. Now you got people cutting up at the alley. It's like, dude, I don't think that's sanitary, man. Which, uh, which, uh, where are you from again? Haiti. Haiti. Because mm -hmm. if you put something like that behind it, you put, you know, the laws. Bye bye. They're driving all the way from Perm. That's like, what is Perm? Hour and a half? Really? They gotta be here at seven o'clock in the morning. Man. Well, if they want quality, they gotta. Oh yeah. I've been cutting them up since like. That's why I was shocked when he like I want to shave. <laughs> oh, cause you knew him when he was so young, yeah, right? What's up with all these kids? I mean, I don't remember people getting beards till they was in their twenties, and now they popping up when they're ten. You know what I'm saying? This is some excellent footage.
what makes I've heard that you're like the number one barbershop in North Dakota period correct um, how does the competitors feel what are you doing so different that they're not doing and talk a little bit about that well, well you look at the, the barbershops that are not doing ethnic hair that's one of the things you know they don't know it and they start with the school also you know what I mean with the school doesn't you know the school that that I went to didn't teach how to cut ethnic hair um, it's something that I've taught myself over the years. Um, so when you have that, it's, it's very hard. It's, you can't compete with that because I'm providing something that they don't know. So a lot of the times where they have like a black dude walk in or somebody walks in that, you know, is different than them, they send them over our way. And for us, if you don't know, we try to learn about it. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter if it's a style or a design or whatever it is. Um, but a lot of our competition is like guys that used to work for us. So my, my, my thing is, as long as I can inspire somebody to go out and step, take a step of faith to better themselves, I say go for it, you know what I mean? What, but, do, uh, what do you think the difference is between, because you inspire people to be a barber, correct. but then they go to be a business person. We both know that's oh, two it's, totally it's, different it's, things. Man, <laughs> and that's something I try to tell them all the time, is that it's the fact that, you know, like, you know, I had a lot of guys that come in and go, you know, barbering is, is, is a high turnover business sometimes. And uh, you know, some some would give me a little trouble here, trouble there. I'm like, just remember, you you want to you want to do your shop one day. The same issue that you're giving me, your barber's gonna be giving you the same thing. So get ready. <laughs> but but my advice is, uh, it's not just cutting hair. You gotta understand how to budget. You gotta understand how to how to manage people. Because you got people from different backgrounds. A lot of time, barbering is not their first choice or first career choice. But when it's not their first career choice and you're trying to teach them about customer service, you're trying to teach them about uh, not just just being on time, be early, um, being uh, just cleaning up after yourself, just making sure that uh, you promote yourself, making sure that when you go somewhere, when you meet somebody, they know that, hey, I'm a barber, that's what I do. That's how you eat. So you gotta make sure you promote uh, the heck out of your business. You gotta make sure that, that you're always looking at what, what are the other barbers are doing so you step your game up that's one of the things that i take pride in is like my shop opens at at eight o'clock thursday friday saturday i'm here like 5 30 a.m and our shop closes at seven i'm seeing for like sometime 10 o'clock at night that's something that i know that my competitors you know they're not willing to put that extra mile and i i make sure that i do Fabian. Fabian. oh where are you from originally I'm you're from Haiti too, yeah. just like uh, Will. Yes. Yeah. All right, we got a big, big old family here. <laughs> yes. So, how many people come to you? You do the braids on? Um, for I think each day I have like six people. Six people? God! Oh, yeah. It was that about an hour or two each visit, or more, or? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, some of them take two hours, some of them three. It depends on what they're giving. Yeah, like this one I'm doing here is um, it's called jet um, lag extension. So I'm just extending his uh, his dress. How long have you been doing hair for? Wow. Yeah. So I've been with Still Cut for about four years. My vibe when I come in here, it's like a big family, you know. Everyone's got their head down, doing good work. I love it. How many times do you poke yourself in the hand? <laughs> oh, a lot of times. <laughs> oh my god. A lot of times. <laughs> Careful. I couldn't do that. I'm a I'm clumsy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm used to it now, so I don't get poked anymore. <laughs> and 
doing it for so long. So what do you think about men's hair? It seems like men are really, really sensitive and just doing everything with their hair, almost more than women now, it seems like. Yeah. What, what's your take on that? Um, I think, you know, they just want to do something different with their hair. Not only getting haircuts all the time. How long, you you said you've been cutting it for how long, bro? Again? Oh my man, that that's a marriage. <laughs> you said you're from Florida too? Yeah. Whereabouts? That's that's one of my uh, my oldest uh, my my longest longest customer too. He's from Florida. Oh really? Yeah. He, 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 he come away with me. So I was. How long have been cutting here? Twelve years. I'm a twelve. The math about that. Yeah, twelve. Oh man. Were you able to get, uh, I know when the, the barbershop opened back up after the pandemic, I mean, it was like crazy. Were you able to take care of everybody at a certain time or people had to like book so far out where it was just crazy? Yeah, they had to book, yeah, they had to book and then, because we didn't, we didn't, we didn't really uh, get working. Yeah, that that's one thing that I didn't like. A lot of these states said you have to have this, you have to this, you have to have that, but you couldn't find anything to, <laughs> to, you know. Whereabouts in Florida? What's that? Where 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 Miami, in Florida? Miami. Oh Miami, M -I -A. that you know what goes on in South Beach. <laughs> <laughs> These Midwestern go there and start acting crazy. <laughs> how, how did he move up? Why is you the one that told him to move up here? Huh? <laughs> because he came, he came and found you guys. He said it backwards, but I forgave him. <laughs> Everybody out there trying to look for a sugar daddy too, you know? Those uh those snowbirds. Snowbirds, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I work for a couple of snowbirds. So if 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 Kenny's not able to ever cut your hair, what are you gonna do? For here or no, just period. What if Kenny decides to take a one year break? Look at all these good barbers they got in here. There you go. <laughs> Okay. Major, so. If Kenny start working, I would have a problem getting my hair cut. Probably have to pay a little bit more, but it, was, it shouldn't be okay. I have my time in New York. I think New York is good just to get it out of your system to say, yeah, I lived here, I did that. Now let me find something it's else. State will, that will teach you how to live. And if oh. you can't make it in nowhere, if you can't, what they say, if you can't make it in New York, you can't make it nowhere, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, okay. it's hardcore. What's your name? New oh, York I know. Yeah. Okay. So, remember those uh, neighborhood that was all drug out? Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. Not anymore. oh, it's all gentrified. Yeah. It's and crazy. Restaurants and, and bars and antique shops and it's okay. all of that. Yeah. Coney Island. I used to love Coney Island when I was, when I was a kid. Yeah, but they have a lot of people that's moving from New York now to the Midwest from uh, okay, after the pandemic. No oh, yeah. There's a lot of people that's moving out of New York now. And guess where they're coming? Where? North Dakota. Really? They're tired of the hardcore life, the high rent, the hustle and the bustle. Mmm. <laughs> When you when you first start in barbering, making sure that you available, you gotta you gotta you gotta be available, because you might get a client that wants to show up at 7 a.m. The shop don't open at 8, or you don't you don't come in till 8 or whatever. Because I'm always here early, um, and then you're afraid that if you come at 7, that you might not get another client till 9. You, you're thinking like, well, there's a two-hour gap. What am I gonna do for two hours? A client is a client. That might be a lifetime client. 
So picture a potential lifer or a guy, guy that you would be cutting their hair every two weeks or every month for the next five, 10 years. That's how, that's how I approach it. And that's how I'm always booked. I'm always cutting. Um, you know, the, my pocket's good, it stays good. And it's something that um, you, can't, you can't achieve without, without finding value in what you do and value your time and value your clients time also is making sure that you go about it the right way because there's a lot of barbers out there they're not going on about it the right way and it starts from when you start barbering even it start before you know your first job you know what i mean that that's how i would put it it started when your first job is making sure that uh you're you're responsible you you're dependable you're not the guy that's setting up set up an appointment and where's this guy at for the next whatever minutes or hours or whatever um you know because people value their time. They don't want to come in and, you know, you're missing an action and, you know what I mean? So. Dependability is huge. Correct. Yeah. You ever did one, one of those fastest fade competitions? Oh man, I got it under three and a half minutes. What? <laughs> uh, I never do the fastest fade competition, but I'll be time myself. Oh, that's crazy, man. It's like he beating you up, huh? <laughs> it's a labor of love, I tell you. Clean, man. That's the uh, that's the babyless, right? Yeah. Everyone switched to them. I don't think no one's messing with the T outliners anymore. Uh, but the, these ones are the bomb now. They're with every penny. They're with every single penny. What's the biggest designs that kids want in their hair these days? In a little stars, lightning bolts, all their initials or the team logo. But stars, it's like every kid loves the stars. You got dad next, huh? No, I got the family right there next. Okay. The whole family. Remember back in the day, we would have to sit in a barber shop for like two or three hours to get a cut. Now it's like, I, I don't know how we did it. <laughs> well, if, if, if it wasn't for COVID, if you don't have an appointment, you might be sitting here for that long. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Because all that waiting area, you see half of it is back there. Oh, yeah, I saw it around. That's crazy. Crazy. 